Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. We are excited to be here. It's always a privilege and an honor to preach the Word of God. I never take this for granted. This is, uh, this is not a job. It's a privilege. And uh, we are not entitled. We are indebted to Christ for what Christ did for us, right? So this is, this is just repayment for the goodness of God that he's done in our lives. Amen? And so uh, I, I'm also very appreciative of uh, Beth and Dustin. You know, when my daughter moved to Calgary eight years ago, they were the, her, her youth pastor. They did a wonderful job with, with her, you know. Not that she needed a whole lot of work, but, you know, she's, you know, but she's, she's doing good. And now I got a grandson, which is uh, probably the biggest hook of bringing me out to Calgary. Uh, the beef is good, but the seafood down east is a lot better. And so, uh, uh, you know, if you really want true seafood, you got you to go to the hometown I'm from. And, uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's really good to be here. And uh, I truly love uh, this young couple so much, seeing the great job they're doing in this church and what God has called them to. And it's, a, it's an honor to be able to be here. It's one thing to be invited to a church once. Uh, that's a great thing. But if you get invited twice, you know, that's a better thing. Amen. That means you didn't blow it the first time you were there. And so it's just great to be able to, to come. And I had, I had two sermons. Actually, I had a sermon all prepared all week long. And I was getting ready. I was going to preach on hope because it's the beginning of Advent. And, uh, you know, I was going to preach on hope this morning. And God changed it all last night as I was praying and just asking God what he desired for me to speak. And I'm really going to speak to you on the true source of the power of God, which is building a culture of honor in any church or in any community. Uh, because the power of God is not owed to us. It's, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be used by the power and the glory of God. How many of how many you want to be used by God mightily in your life. Amen. And, and, and it's not because we're entitled to be used of God. It's a privilege to allow God to use our lives to be able to see supernatural things begin to happen. I've been in ministry for 32 years and, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of things and at first I needed to prove myself, but you know, when you get so busy trying to uh, prove yourself, you stop being yourself. And so uh, you don't need to prove yourself to be yourself, right? How I mean, you know, the best person God's going to know it is already who you are. And so, you know, I don't need to be like anybody else. I went through an identity crisis. I tried to be like T.D. Jakes. I tried to be like this one. I tried to be like that one because I figured who maybe who I was was not good enough. But you know what? God called me, right? You know, the Bible says we've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And so when God calls you, he calls you for a reason. So the thing about Christianity, you don't have to try to be like everybody around you. You can just be who God created you to be, right? But the thing that's in common is we all got to allow God to change us, right? How many of you know we all need change in our life? You know what, well, when I started in ministry, I thought I knew everything. And I was going to show everybody how it should be done. Boys, that came to an end quickly. And so, and so you, want, you, you want to try, and, and, and then you, you just get busy, right? You, in your 20s, you're trying to find yourselves. In your 30s, you're trying to prove yourself. In your 40s, you just don't care. And then uh, in your 50s, you're like, we got to leave a legacy. Now, we know a little bit of something. We got to leave something behind, right? And so, you know, I went through all those things in my life, and, and uh, the most important thing about Christianity is uh, being one. It's just being one. And in the culture of honor, everybody, and, and we don't see a lot of honor today in society or in anything we're doing. We don't see a lot of parents being honored. We don't see a lot of people being honored. And, you know, it's because of one thing. Because before there is honor, there needs to be something else. Honor is not something that comes automatically. It's something that has to be added to your life. Listen to this. This is what I wrote. In the body of Christ, we must have a culture of honor if we're going to walk out the plans and the purposes of God for our lives. To have a culture of honor, we first must have a spirit of humility. And so without humility, there'll never be any honor in our lives. That we'll never be able to show honor, we'll never be able to have honor. Proverbs chapter 15 verse 33 says, the fear of the Lord is instructions of wisdom, but before honor, there is humility. And then in Proverbs 18, 12 says, before destruction the heart of a man is haughty, but before honor, there is humility. And you know, I start thinking about humility
ready because if you're really going to tap into the true source of the power of God in our lives, we must have a humble spirit because this is not about me trying to prove my ministry, me trying to prove my anointing, me trying to prove my gifts. This is about humility. It's all about Jesus getting all the glory at the end of the day. It's all about God having his way and his plan and his purpose in our life. It's not about me. See, we made all Christianity all about us and not about him. And the reason it becomes so inward and we're not finding the true source of the power of God is because it's all about us. But when it becomes all about Jesus, the power of God begins to flow and operate in each and every one of our lives. And we begin to see the miracle power of God. And so I want to see miracles. I don't know about you. Do you want to see miracles? I want to see miracles. I want to see change. I want to see people that are bound to be delivered, people that are fearful to be free, people that are full of anxiety to live without anxiety in their life. And it's not because I'm a good, mo- you know, everything has been about being a good motivational speaker. We don't need to be motivational speakers. We need to be transformational speakers. There's a big thing between motivating somebody and seeing by somebody being transformed. And it's more than being positive. You know, we all look sometimes like Christianity looks like something like the movie. I don't know if you ever watched the movie, What About Bob? You know, Bob goes, I feel good, I feel great, I feel wonderful, I'm doing the steps, you know, and he, he's trying to get on the bus, you know, and, and, and we look like that. You know, we feel good, we feel great, we feel, we, 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 you know, we're beautiful, whatever we, we want to put that we are on our dream board, and, and it looks all fantastic, but in the inside, we're not transformed, and so our words are not matching our hearts and the transformation of our lives. And humility, when I came to understand this, I I, I don't have a healing ministry. I don't have a prophetic ministry. Jesus does, right? I am a tool that Jesus uses, and he gets, he allows me to be in partnership with him. I get to experience and be an eyewitness of what God is going to do in people's lives. Do you know when God's power and miracles happen, it's not a testimony of how I am anointed. It's a testimony that Jesus is still the resurrected Christ. Every time somebody gets healed, saved, or delivered, it's a testimony of the crucifixion, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. It says again and again and again that the enemy is defeated, and Jesus is still Lord. Woo! That don't make you happy. Nothing's going to. Right? And so we're here as an eyewitness. We're still in the book of Acts. Do you know what was beautiful about the book of Acts and about the resurrection of Jesus? There was over 500 eyewitnesses that Jesus rose from the dead. And you know what? How many eyewitnesses is there today that is still a witness that Jesus is still alive and well? That we don't serve a God that is dead and buried and forgotten about. We serve the one true God who is and was and ever, forever will be. He has the same power to do today what he did back then. That's the exciting part about Christianity. It's not about me. When Christianity can stop becoming about us and be called all about him, he will make everything about us. (laughs) Right? We make everything about Jesus. Jesus makes everything about us. But when we have a spirit of humility, we release the power of God to be able to do what God desires to do. My definition about the word humility, humility is the place of entire dependency upon God. Humility has nothing about being independent. It has everything to do about being dependent. Amen? It's entire dependency upon God. Jesus came to bring humility back to the earth and to make us partakers of it. He, Jesus, humbled himself and became obedient to death. His humility gave his death value and became our redemption. I'm going to say that again. He, Jesus, himself became obedient to death. His humility gave his death value. Without the humility of Jesus, death had no value because he humbled himself to the point of death. His death had value and it became our redemption. Do you know Jesus himself, 
was a humble man. He humbled himself. The problem with ministry today, if you want to really be used in the power of God, the problem with ministry today is about look, look at me when we should be looking all to the Father. Jesus himself never took any credit about his own messages. He never took credit about anything he ever had. He said, I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what I hear my Father do. So he didn't copyright anything he ever did. It's the truth. In number, listen, I'm going to go quick, quickly through this because I want to get somewhere. He came from heaven. He came from heaven to do the will of his Father. That's John 6, 38. It says, for I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. You know, in ministry, it's not everything you want to do. It's everything God wants you to do. Whew. That's what ministry is. Ministry is not doing my plan. My plan in my life was to have a red surge and to be an RCMP officer. That was my plan. My plan was to be an RCMP officer and stop all my uncles from drinking and driving. That was the plan. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to grow up. I wanted to be an RCMP officer. But doing, when you humble yourself, it's not about your plan. It's about God's plan in your life. And how many you know that God has a plan for you that's greater than the plan that you have for yourself? And if you allow God's plan to come through in your life, you will see things you've never seen before ever happen in your life. Do you know, just in the last little while, I had a nephew that was born with an autoimmune disease had no immune system. If he took a vaccine for something, he would have to go back in two weeks because his immune system would not be able to take the vaccine. He would, his lymph nodes would get swollen. They begin to think that he had some form of cancer. All these things, we prayed for him for years and years and years. And right, he's 14 years old right now my nephew, and we've prayed for him. We believe God for him. Sometimes the answer doesn't come. Some people say, well, why didn't it happen when I prayed? That's the problem because you think it's because you prayed. It doesn't happen because of I. It happens because of him. It happens because of his plan and his will. Well, this summer, you know, we were having a service in Kapolei. Some of you don't know where maybe Kapolei is. It's not a very big place. The whole population of Kapolei is 2,200 people, and it's a very uh, French Acadian community. And uh, I was having a service there at the church that I had pastored. And uh, my little nephew, 14 years old, he comes up to the front. Uh, we prayed for him, but we've been praying for him for years. And so all of a sudden, he just goes under the power of God, and he, uh, he, he didn't fall back. Backwards, he felt forward, and uh, I, I mean, he began to shake under the presence of God. I mean, I mean, you can't make this stuff up, and 14-year-old boys won't make it up for you. You know, they're not trying to give you, make you feel great about yourself. I mean, he went down. When he got back up, he knew he was absolutely healed, but he was so determined that Jesus was there to heal that he went and got his grandmother that was deaf in both ears, and when she came up to the front, we prayed for her, and she began to hear instantaneously. Why? Because Jesus was in the room. God was about to manifest something, and then a couple Couple weeks after, my young nephew goes back to see the doctor and to give him a clean bill of health without an autoimmune disease in his life. That is the presence and the power of God. That's what God begins to do. And so I had an uncle also not very long ago, his blood sugars went to zero. I mean, you know, when blood sugar, it's not good to have high blood sugars, but it's not good to have zero blood sugar. So he was, he was in the coma. They said he was brain dead. They said, you know what? It didn't look very good. Looked like he was going to go home and be with Jesus because he knew the Lord. And uh, I'm praying. I'm declaring God's word, and we're just believing God for him, and I'm driving in the car. And God says, he says, he speaks to my heart. He says, when you walk into that room to see your uncle, he's going to wake up. And I'm thinking, really? You know, I'm not even allowed in the room. I'm not immediate family. You know, with everything, all the restrictions today, you just can't go and see anybody. It doesn't matter if you're a clergy or not. So my aunt said, we're going to go undercover. So she says, you put on a mask, you sanitize your hands, and you follow me. We're going straight in. So I put on a mask, I sanitized my hand, and we just headed straight in to the ICU. 
I walked into that room and he yawned and began to wake right up, right out of a bed, out of a coma, where he said he was brain dead. That is the power and the presence of God in somebody's life. Now, that doesn't happen because I'm a great guy. That doesn't happen because my name is Pastor Brian Bork. That doesn't happen because I've been in ministry for 32 years. That happens because Jesus is just that good and God is just that real. And when we humble ourselves and able to give God all the credit for it, he continues to do amazing things in each and every one of our lives. Oh, I'm excited. Amen. Are you? But Jesus never even took any credit. He said that my teachings are not my own. He took no ownership of what the Father gave him. That's found in John 7, 16 to 17. Jesus answered and said to them, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man wills to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whatever it be of God or whatever he speaks of himself. Jesus cons consistently humbled himself. He said, I'm not here on my own. And see, we are not here on our own. I'm not here today on my own. Because if the devil could have, he would have, and he couldn't, and I'm still here. The reason I'm still sustained here today, after having epilepsy for 10 years, after having throat cancer, after having only 40% lung capacity, after having a bad esophagus, after having high blood pressure, after having, you know, diabetes, the reason I'm still here and healed, of all, I don't take one medication, the reason I'm still here and able to be sustained by the presence and the power of God is because Jesus is that good in our lives. Amen. We're not here on our own. He has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of us. And as long as we know his plan and his purpose, he keeps manifesting his goodness in our lives. Jesus said, I do nothing on my own. So he doesn't have his teaching on his own. He don't speak on his own. He's not here on his own. And he does nothing on his own. And I don't got time, but that's found. I'm not going to read every one of them. That's John 8, 27 to 29. And then number five, he says, he said, I have not come on my own, but him that sent me. John 8, 42. Number six, he says, I'm not seeking glory of myself. You know, and we need not to be seeking glory of ourselves. We need to give all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor to Jesus. I don't care if anybody knows who Brian Bork is. It's not that important. We're not here to make our names known, but to make Jesus known in all the earth. Jesus is the one that needs to be famous. Jesus is the one that needs to be known, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's where the miracle working power of God truly is. And then number seven, he says, the word that I say to you are not just my own. That's John 14, 10. He says, believe it thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but my Father that dwells in me, and he doeth the work. You know, Jesus said if we ask anything in his name, he will do it. I don't have to do any doing. I just got to do the asking. And when we understand in humility that this Christianity is a partnership with Jesus Christ, it's just like a marriage. Let me tell you something. Any pastor that's pastoring a church, he's not pastoring on his own, or she's not pastoring on their own. They're pastoring together. Nobody does anything on their own. And one of the problems has been this. When we feel entitled and don't have a spirit of humility, we don't respect and honor what came before us. The reason we are here now is because there's been great men and women of God that have come through the decades and the ages and the years before. We stand upon their shoulders and we say God is the same. Yesterday nobody's ever done any ministry on their own. And we've never seen the power of God on our own. It's not to our credit. It's to the credit of God and to the credit of people that have broken ground before. Do you know the great healing movement you know, do you know Canada has seen, has sent out more healing evangelists than any, almost any other nation in the world? Do you know that our maple leaf is a representative of healing to the nations? You got people like, you know, Amy Simple McPherson, Mary Woodward Edder, John G. Lake, they're all Canadians. 
And I get to read their books of what they've seen of the power and glory of God and think I'm not on ministry on my own, seeing the power and the presence of God. I stand upon their shoulders of a John G. Lake, of an Amy Simple McPherson. Come on, somebody. You know, and, and nobody gets to where they are all by themselves. Because, but when we're not humble, we think we're it. And then when we think we're it, the presence of God doesn't flow anymore. Because it's become all about us and not about him. Do you know, when Jesus was on the earth, it was not all about him. It was all about the Father, and it was all about you. He died to save you. He went to the healing, to the whipping post to heal you. He was battered for you. He was broken for you. It was never about him having a throne. He didn't come to the earth as God. He came to, to the earth as a servant. He served because it was about the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we come and it's about the mandate of the gospel and it's about others and it's about God, the power and the presence of God will continually flow through your life. Ministry has never been easier when it's not been about me. I got a motto. I don't take the glory and I don't take the blame. So I don't own the praise and I don't own the responsibility. The only thing I own is the act of obedience to do what he told me to do and I leave the results to God. That's it. If he says lay hands on the sick, I'm going to lay hands on the sick. It's his responsibility that they may recover. I don't have to live with that. I wonder what happened, what didn't happen. I give that to God because it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. So I don't own it. It's funny. I'm in partnership in something I don't own. But most Christians should just be silent partners. <laughs> you know, there was a song one time, some of God's children should be seen and not heard. But anyway, hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know if that's an old Petra song or not. I think it is. But anyway, I mean, I'm dating myself here. But, but you know, I, I, I'm soon going to be 52 years of age. And I really don't care about me no more. Humility is the source to the power of God. And when you don't have to own the responsibility or the glory of the matter, you are able to operate freely as the Father wills. The end game is Jesus wins. <laughs> It don't matter what happens in this world. The end game, he is Lord. At the end game, he's coming again. At the end game, he is going to be victorious. At the end game, I'm telling you what, I don't know if you read the end of the book. We win. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done. Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 said, being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every other name. That at the name of Yeshua or Jesus, every knee should bow of things of heaven, things in the earth, and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The reason he's given the name that's above every other name is because of the humility. He laid down his royalty to take on humanity so that we could have eternity. Whew. He laid down his royalty. He took on humanity 
so that we might have eternity. There's no greater example than humility in all of Scripture but Jesus. Now, it says before there is honor, there's humility. Do you know why you want to have humility? Because you want to come into honor. The word honor, listen to this. I'm almost done. I'm wrapping up. I'll talk, I'll talk faster. I'll talk in French. It says, it says, it says to honor means to pay respect. Honor means to pay respect. It means to perceive value of worth. What has value is in the eyes of the beholder. Willingly be assigned to something. So what did Jesus did? He paid respect and he perceived the value of humanity. The reason he humbled himself because he valued me and he values you. I don't know if anybody told you something. Jesus didn't die for anything. He died for you. He died because he loves you. He's already made up his mind. He decided he was going to love you if you believe him or not. And that's something he loves the world without the world ever loving him back. Because he saw the value in humanity, he was able to have humility. Whew. And without humility, there is no way to have honor. Honor is not a promotion, a promotional game. Some people try to honor somebody to try to go up a ladder or do something. I got another word for that. Well, I ain't going to use it here. Anyway. <laughs> you got the picture? But anyway, that's not honor. You honor people by seeing value in them. You know why he gave you the Holy Spirit? He gave you the ability to see the power and the glory of God because he values you. God does not want to have dominion without you. He gave you his authority. He gave you his dominion over all the works of the devil. He wants not, God doesn't want to do a work through this earth alone. He wants a partnership. He wants a partnership with me and you that he filled us with the Holy Spirit and he gave us the ability to do the things that he did. He said, the things that I do, you'll do also in greater than these because he goes to the Father and makes intercession on my behalf. It's a partnership. And if we understood Christianity, that we're able to humble ourselves and give God the glory that we are in partnership with Jesus, we will see the power of God. Why wouldn't he want to set me free? Why wouldn't he want to heal me? Why would, people say, well, why, why wouldn't he? If he was willing to die for me, is there anything he would withhold from me? Good preaching, Pastor. Amen. Honor means honorable use. Honor is a mark of respect. Precious value, price, proceed, sum, and value. What do we honor? You can't honor anything you're not, able, you're not willing to humble yourself for. We need to honor God and his word. Truth is not what you think is truth. <laughs> Let me help you here. Truth is not what you think is truth. Truth is what God says is truth. He did say in Roman, let every man be a liar and let God be true. Because everybody's trying to perceive truth within their own experience. Truth is not truth because you had an experience or did not have an experience. Truth is truth because God is just, he's righteous, he's real, he's holy, he's honorable. I'm telling you, God, the word of God is truth because it's full of God. Amen. So we honor God and his word. John 5, 23 says that all men should honor the son, even as they honor the father. He that honoreth not the son, honoreth not the father, which has sent him. Now listen, this is not my business to go here, but I'm going to go here. Because one thing about a special speaker, you can blow in, blow up, and blow out. But Proverbs 3, verse 9 says how we honor God. See, people... And somebody might not like this, but this is just the truth anyway, so you deal with it. 
It says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with thy first fruit of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy press shall burst out with new wine. Tithing or giving is not a religious act. It's an act of humility. It's an act of saying to God, I trust you with my life. I humble myself. Come on, somebody. This is a, because it's a place of humility. It's a place of faith. It's not a place of religious standards or church membership. It's a place that I humble myself and put my trust in the hands of my God. It really is an act of humility. Tithing, giving, is an act of total dependency upon God. You know, I give the waitress 20%. Why can't I give God 10? (laughs) Good preaching, Pastor. I'm helping you, Dustin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No, listen, listen, I'm telling you, it is an act of humility. But I tell you what, it's amazing how many people have pride. And giving should not be something you're prideful about. It should actually be done in secret. That he who sees in secret should reward you openly. So we honor God. We honor his word, and then we honor one another. You know, it's funny. When you think you know everything, you don't need anybody to help you. And let me tell you something. If you're around people and they think you know everything, they won't be there to help you. (laughs) Right? How many of you ever been around people that know everything? Don't lift up your hand if you're one of them. But... You know, you just know everything. So there's no conversation. There's no relationship with somebody that knows everything. There's just long-suffering and patience. <laughs> Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says, Let's love, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, honor, preferring, one another. You know what? I'm so tired of ministers putting other ministers down if they're doing good. When they're not doing good, they have no faith. When they're doing good, they're compromising. Lord, have mercy. You can never never get ahead. We got to prefer one another. If this church begins to blow out of its seams and everything's going, to, you know what? Thank God, praise God. You know, we need to be encouraged. We need to be preferring one another, being there, encouraging one another, honoring one another. But if you don't have any humility, it's all about what, what, what you might not have that somebody does have, so you become jealous. You become prideful. You know what? We need to be celebrating not only our victories, but we need to be celebrating the victories of others. If there's somebody here that's had a victory, celebrate each and every one victory. That's how you honor them. You prefer them. The reason we can't mentor anybody is we think we're too good that nobody else can do what we're doing. Lord, have mercy. If nobody can do what you have done, it's because you've been too prideful to teach them on how to do it. Now, don't shut me down. I'm teaching real good. Jesus gave everything he had to 12. 12 went and gave everything they had to 120. And 120 changed the world. This thing is not about keeping it. It's about giving it away. Everything I have, you want to impart. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, freely as you've received, go freely give. If you've got gifts of the Spirit, impart them into somebody else. Lay your hands on somebody else. Believe that what you're doing, that somebody else will do it. Believe that God is able to do in others what he's done in you. If you believe that God's used you for healing, pray for somebody else to be used in healing. And let me tell you something about healing. Healing is not because you're perfect or you're that great. Healing is just a matter of laying hands on enough people, some are going to recover. But no matter what happens, you never stop. So we honor God. We honor his word. We honor each other. And some people are going to have problems with this scripture. 
but you should even honor the people that are not even honorable. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading it to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 19 says this. And if they were all one members, where, where were the body? But now are they many members, but yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee. Nor again can the head to the feet. You know, if everybody's a brain and the brain can't go anywhere, it's absolutely useless. I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. Our uncomely parts have more abundant come. Listen, when somebody looks like they have nothing to be honored, if you show them value, they'll step up to a whole other platform you never thought they would step onto. If I see, let me tell you, the reason why people aren't stepping up to the plate is because we are not seeing enough value in them for them to be willing to step up to what God has. If you begin to honor them and you're able to humble yourself and see the value in somebody else, oh, you just watch what happens. They're going to step up to a whole new other level. Do you know what I love about the victory movement? It didn't just become about two people. Reach, teach, mobilize. A revival, they gave it away. I look at Dr. George and Dr. Hazel. I tell you what, any of us who have a church of 1,200 or 1,400 in Ledbridge, Alberta, would say, this is good. We're just going to keep this right here. We're just going to buckle in. They gave it away and went to Medicine Hat. Went from Medicine Hat, went to Calgary. Let me tell you something. That's something when you're willing to give it away. Honor gives away. The victory movement has lost, in my opinion, a bit of steam do you know why? Because nobody sometimes is willing to give it away. We need to become, to be a movement, not a monument. What's a monument? Monument is where we've been. A movement is where we're going. <laughs> right? And it's not about being, whoa, look what we've done in victory. No, it's let's keep going and see what victory's going to be doing. Stepping out in faith and seeing the goodness and the presence of God begin to be, be used in people's lives. But none of us are going to get to the next level if we, do not, if we do not cultivate a culture of honor. I tell you, I heard this message first from uh, Bethel Ministries under Bill Johnson. I can't remember Danny Goki, uh, I can't remember his last name, but anyway, and he preached this, and you know, I, I liked his version, but then I, I went and studied, and I found this whole humility thing, and I like my version better. But anyway, that, does, that, 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 that doesn't mean his teaching wasn't good. I, it, just, it's just, it just becomes personal, right? It just becomes personal. I found something in my own heart, and I found out that since humility has become a part of my life, I've seen more release of the supernatural ability of God. Because it's not about me. It's all about Him. And listen. There's way more scriptures than I could go to, but the Bible says that God will exalt the humble and he will abase the proud. The way up is down. Do you know what worship is? Worship is not a song. It's a sign of humility. You can get on your knees and lift up your hands and worship Him. Scripture actually says they bowed their faces to the ground and worship, and the glory of God filled the house. The glory doesn't come 
because you're talented. It comes because you're humble. And the desire for transformation needs to bring you to the place of humility. You know, glory of God show up in your house. Do you know if you're a husband that thinks he's always right, you don't have to be. If you're a wife that thinks she's always right, you don't have to be. Do you know what I found out about husbands and wives? One can't change the other. Because if my wife could change me, it'd be done. But it's not done. Now she can pray for me, but the only one that can change me is Jesus. So we continually humble ourselves and go to his presence until there's transformation in my life. You know what else I found out about humility? I don't have to hang on to be right. I got a right to this. I'm going to hang on. I don't have to hang on to that unforgiveness, that offense. I lay that stuff down. I don't need to be right. I just need to be changed. <laughs> that, that's the bottom line. I don't need to be right. I don't need anything. I just need to be changed from glory to glory to glory. And I need more change today than I ever did before. But I humble myself beneath the hand of an almighty God who is able to transform my life from glory to glory to glory. Because Father God, I need you. I don't need anything else. That's it. That's the message God told me to preach to you. Andrew Murray wrote about humility. I tell you, you know what's humbling? It's when you lay hands on somebody and you see them recover. You know what's humbling? When God uses you, in partnership with you, to see somebody be set free from drugs and alcohol. Whew. What an amazing God. Let me tell you what humility also does, and I'm going to stop right here. And if you need prayer, I'll pray for you. Humility lets go of its struggles. We need to be humble enough to bring our junk to God. Well, I want to deal with it. Well, how's it working for you? How's it working? I'm tired of being in control. I don't want to control this church. I don't want to control. I want to be, I want it to be out of control in God's very best. I don't need to manipulate it. I don't need to try to make it happen. I just want to release it. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I, you just want to release this church. I'm not, I'll tell you what, the best thing you can do as a pastor is release it to God. It's not yours anyway. You know, one time we're going through COVID. I get in the office. I was on vacation. Pile of mail on, pile of bills on the desk. You know what I did? I took the mail. I looked up to heaven. I said, Jesus, you got mail. Honest to goodness. I said, you got bills. I said, I didn't create this COVID stuff. I didn't shut down the church. You got mail. When I told him he got mail and I released it to him, a guy from Montreal called me. He said, I was just praying. And he says, God said, you're behind on your bills. How much do you owe? I said, we owe about 10,000. We're behind. He said, the check is in the mail. He says, God told me, take care of his church. I'll tell you what I said. You heard from God. But you know what? Church bills aren't my bills. Don't take this wrong, but it's a little bit prideful to think you own the church. 
and those are your bills. God, you got mail. God, you got a board member that's a little bit disgruntled with me. Just letting you know, I don't own this. I'm the silent partner. I think I could have got out of a lot of trouble if I could have stayed the silent partner. But oh, me and my big mouth, we get in trouble a lot. But thank God he's so forgiven. Just give it to Jesus. Next week, I'll be making an announcement on my Facebook. I'm taking a church that's totally out of my comfort zone. Probably the biggest step of faith I'm ever going to take it. Maybe my ministry. But oh, how excited I am. Not to think of what I'll do, but what will God do through it all. <laughs> I moved to Calgary with not even a job. He's been just so good. It's all his. So let me tell you something. If you're struggling through anything in your life, and you want to see the power and the presence of God, just be humble enough to bring it to Jesus and allow Jesus to do something supernatural in your life. But humility is releasing what you think is a problem. Amen.